is the kingdom at hand. It's here in the person of Jesus Christ. The kingdom came in the person of the king. There was like an inauguration of the kingdom and there's a consummation coming. It's been inaugurated by Jesus Christ. Hello. I'm excited to preach again. <laughs> How many of you guys were here last week when I preached last week? All right, awesome. Um, if you were not, I highly recommend you go back and listen to the sermon. I'm going to quickly recap it, but I'm not going to be able to preach another, like I won't get anywhere today if I re-preach that, but it is pretty foundational to my message today. This is part two um, of that. Um, as we talked about last week, we were talking about the binding up of the broken heart from Isaiah 61, but this is the ministry of Jesus he came to heal our hearts, right? How many of you guys remember that? How many of you last week or throughout the week got breakthrough and healing in your heart after that sermon? Can you raise your hand? That's amazing. I love that. I had somebody come up um, to me on, um, uh, was it like during this, the whole revival week, and he was just telling me how much it impacted his life, that he got free from something that he'd struggled with for so long. And that's really the goal of these teachings. Yes, of course, yeah. Tom's going to testify. So I'll testify. I, I shared it a little bit. Katie said she didn't hear me say it, so I'll, I'll share it with all of you. Remember how last week she shared about me being, uh, we call it a trigger, um, in the airport? How many of you guys remember that story, right? So the car breaks down as Ben Potter, our old worship leader, was dropping us off at the airport. He breaks down in my car right in front of, you know, the airport. And I'm like, See you later. And he's just like, broken car. He's just like, and I'm triggered by it. And my kids, you know, they're going through the airport. And Nehemiah has a knife in his backpack. So they're taking it away. And he's like, that's my favorite knife. You won't take it. I'm like, they're taking it, bud. You know, they take Esther's lotion that we got from Africa. And she's like, that's my only one. And they're just losing it. And I'm already triggered from the car being broke down, you know. So Katie brought that up in her, in her sermon. And I thought, I haven't, I don't think I've ever dealt with that. I never asked Holy Spirit what that was, why. I just like shut down. I was just there. And Katie's like, help, you know, the kids are, and I'm just like, <laughs> but not about them, but about the car. And I asked Holy Spirit last week when Katie brought us through it, I said, Holy Spirit, what was that? And he brought me back to when I was in high school, when I was homeless. And when I had to go from kind of place to place and trying to find people that would let me stay with them. And the Lord reminded me, I said, well, Lord, what's the main emotion or, or, or lie that I'm believing from this hurt? And he says, that you are a burden. So I felt like I was burdening Ben and the, that wound of being a burden. And I realized that's why it's hard for me when Angie has to sneak attack me with, we're going on vacation, and she has to sneak attack me with, hey, we're raised in, we're going to give, and we're going to bless. And it's like hard for me to receive because I don't want to be a burden. Well, last week the Lord healed it. So, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Amen. We like that. <laughs> That's amazing. So, last week I explained a little bit of the concept of the term that we use in our healing, which is just Jesus coming and healing our hearts. I talked about how, um, what those triggers look like. Um, you know, briefly, they can look like um, shutdowns. They can look like explosions. They can look like isolation. They can look like different things. But at some point, these emotions come up, whatever it is, if it's confusion or being overwhelmed. And a lot of times, they come up in the most inconvenient times. They can come up in the middle of a fight with your spouse, you're disciplining your children, you know, all sorts of different things. <clears throat> And these things will come up and it kind of, the, the emotions rise up and they kind of take, they take control in one way or another. And that is what, why Jesus says he wants to heal our hearts. And so a lot of our different, they call them triggers. Um, and so, you know, they can happen, you know, some of them are little, some are big. I use the example of PTSD is a, is a massive trigger. Um, you know, people that have been sexually abused, different things like that. But they're, they are, they're as simple as that. You know, when we have those experiences in our life, and if we're having them repeatedly, 
um, as small or as big as they are, we actually can bring those things to Jesus for him to heal our hearts so we don't have to continue to believe those lies anymore or feel like a burden or feel rejected or feel abandoned. And, and it's so amazing because this is, this is sozo. This is being made whole. And as our mind gets renewed, and now as we learn to walk in this, we become just like Jesus. Jesus was whole. <laughs> he was perfect. And he, he's our example, and we're supposed to become like him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he does this work in us. But we actually have to allow him to do that. How many of you so, um, heard Rich Vera, um, one of the nights he talked about, we have to get angry at the devil, right? A lot of some people, sometimes that can be confusing. People say that, and you think, I don't want to be angry. No, no, no. And he wasn't talking about being angry at God. He was talking about we got to get angry with our situation, enough anger at our situation, enough anger at the devil that we actually say, enough's enough. That's it. This isn't going to be in my life anymore. I'm not going to allow this. And we actually do something about it because... Complacency isn't going to help you. Being content with your sickness. And I don't even, and you know, same with like healing. I don't care if your medication you're on works. Get angry at it because you shouldn't have to be on medication. So some of us are like, well, my medication works. I'm fine. Are you healed? Are you sozo? Get angry at the devil, no matter how it's affecting you right now or not. Um, this, is, this is so important that we actually become desperate for more of God, desperate for more healing in our souls, desperate for reconciliation in our marriages, desperate for healing in our physical bodies if we need it, deliverance from anxiety and depression. we got to actually want it. This is part of our steps and that we teach in our school ministry of actually getting freedom is to be um, desperate and honest. We actually have to be honest with ourselves. We can't fall into any type of religion that makes us think, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just, oh, I don't struggle with that. Like, like, a, like a false religious thing that says, I'm gonna speak life over myself, which is definitely do that. But sometimes it's like this weird thing where it's like, I'm not sick, but you really are, so then you don't pray. Or like, but, or, you know, I, I, you know, I'm just amazing, I'm amazing, I'm amazing. And then yet you don't then deal with this ugly fruit that's coming up. And the reality is, is like we talk about um, terminology like, I'm having symptoms of this. You don't have to agree with the devil and walk hands and say, I'm an angry person. You don't have to do that. But if you're experiencing anger in your life, you don't also have to pretend like it's not there to not, because then you won't get free from it. Does that make sense? So sometimes it can kind of go both ways where, where, um, where we're actually like agreeing with the devil. You don't want to do that. But you also can literally like somehow be in this like weird place of denial and call it faith. And then yet you don't go after breakthrough because nothing's wrong with you. And that's just as deceptive as it is to agree with the devil. So you got to find a middle ground with the Lord where you go, I'm struggling with this. This isn't who I am, but I don't want this anymore. So don't curse yourself and speak death over yourself, but also do not deny and ignore problems in your life because they're never going to go away if you do. And Jesus paid. It's all the benefits. He paid for you to be made whole. This is the benefits of salvation. So don't let those go to waste by being in denial. Another really important thing that kind of came out through the week and different things I wanted to really address is when I'm preaching today, the only person I'm preaching to is you. This is really important. <laughs> I'm preaching to you, not to your spouse, not to your children. I'm preaching to you. A lot of times, you know, we saw this a lot this last week um, when, when Prophet would ask people what they want a breakthrough for. They'd come up and ask for a breakthrough for their kids or breakthrough for their spouse or breakthrough in their marriages or breakthrough in different things. And none of that's like wrong. It's not that you shouldn't be praying for those things. But then he would say, but I see all these diseases in your life. How come you didn't ask for that? And how, how you know, and I really kind of throughout the week, the Lord kept speaking to me. And I really was like, you know, a lot of us take on these false burdens of our family members and neglect ourselves. That's not like, that's not holy, that's not the Lord's will. The Lord actually cares about you too. You're worthy of it. A lot of us have dealt with this with our kids our whole lives where we put our kids before ourselves and now as adults, we still are carrying all those burdens and we're still completely broken. That's not the will of the Lord for you. So I'm not preaching to your kids today. I'm not preaching to your spouse today. A lot of us want our husbands to be made whole so our marriage will get better. But you actually have to, you, if, you, if you were just like Jesus, your marriage would be different. Let's just be real. If Jesus lived with your spouse, your marriage would not look the way it did. If your spouse lived with Jesus, your spouse would be saved. So <laughs> the only thing that you can do, because you can't control your spouses, 
The only thing you can do is take the specks out of your own eye and allow the Lord to heal your heart, allow him to deliver you, allow him to heal you, and I guarantee your marriage will be transformed. So this sermon today is not for your spouse. This is for you. It's not for your kids. It's not for your parents. It's not for anyone else other than you because the problem is in our own line. You know, the thing about that with our kids, man, this is so important for you to grasp a hold of. A lot of the things our kids are battling are because of devils we didn't kick out of the land. So you want freedom in your kids, you kick the devils out of your land and they will be free. You want them to have freedom, you get freedom. The Lord had to really convict me of this last week. I hear I've been praying for breakthrough. And we're always praying for our kids. And I'm not saying don't pray for your kids. Pray for your kids. But, but that should be a portion of your prayer. But uh, most of your, your, uh, your attitude should really be about you being transformed. That's where most of your heart should be. If you're obsessed about other people being transformed, you're in the wrong. That's not the heart of God. When God's spending time with you, he's not, he wants to spend time with you. He wants to disciple you. He wants to prune you. He's not sitting there trying to spend time with you caring about your husband. He, spent, he does that with your husband or with your wife. But when he's with you, he's with you. But this last week, I was super convicted. I was been praying for breakthrough, different things. You know, I mean, how many of us, and some of my kids are in the room, so I don't want to be like, I don't want to put them on the spot. But how many of your kids wished your kids obeyed you a little bit more, right? Okay, all right. So I've been praying for that. I've been really praying for that. Lord, Lord, may they obey, may they honor, may they respect, may they, may they not rebel against me or, or you, Lord. And I've been praying for that and going after that and going after that. And on Tuesday, I'm, Rich Vera was speaking to our staff. I don't know why I keep putting this lid on because then I have to take it off each time. Rich Vera was preaching to our staff as a team and uh, talking about serving. And he was talking about, I mean, it was so good. I don't have the whole sermon itself, but about being basically serving so low that you're like a slave because God says we're servants. Servants don't even have rights. Servants, like, I mean, they have given up everything to serve. And he was, I mean, it was, it was such a good word. And I, here I am thinking, you know, I'm so glad he's preaching on this because, you know, the team needs this. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and, uh, and I'm like halfway through. The, he's halfway through, and all of a sudden, the Lord starts convicting me so deeply of my own rebellion, of my own dishonor, of my own sin towards my husband, towards people, towards my teachers, and through different people, and started just showing my life how really there was a root of rebellion in my life that I'd been working to kill, but it had not been uprooted and I hadn't killed it yet. And so I look and I see down the generational line and I'm wondering, why is there so much of that? And the Lord literally is like, because of you. <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't like that answer. <laughs> I was like, no, but I mean, I seriously, I was repenting for about three days of all these things that the Lord was showing me that this root of rebellion in my own life. And I'm just like, Oh my God. And like, Lord, I just repent for that time. I went to my principal and was talking about my teacher. And Lord, I repent all these things that I had almost even tell stories about and boast about because they're funny. Well, they're funny, but they weren't Christ-like. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, like I have been so rebellious. And my husband, the Lord was showing me like, yes, you, you've grown so much and you submit to him, but how much do you undermine him with the kids? How much do you, do you think that you're right when he, instead of just trusting him? How much, like, and I'm just sitting there like, oh my God, like I, Lord, I literally went home, honey, and I repented to you. I'm like, well, honey, I'm so sorry for every time I undermine you. I'm so sorry for when I think that I'm smarter than you, no more than you. And I just started repenting to him. And I realized that the revolution I want in my home starts with me. A lot of us, the things that we're seeing in our children are seeing in our, in our homes a lot of those things stem from us. And so I really want you today to really look at yourself because that's where the greatest breakthrough in your life is gonna come when you allow God to uproot every ungodly thing in your life. You will see breakthrough not only in your marriages and in your gender, but in your whole, if you're down to your grandkids and the generations to come. That's what we gotta kick every devil out of our land so our grandkids don't have to fight those battles anymore, that they would walk in generational blessings. So it only is gonna, they're only gonna get as much freedom as you're willing to get for yourself. So don't let those religious spirit tell you that, that really what they need is that they need it. No, no, you need freedom and they will be free. All right, so let's deal with that today. That was my, you know, I really, that was totally not my sermon, but I was really fired up this last week about that. Hmm. All right, so I talked about that last week with inner healing. And I went through what lives in wounds. Um, we talked about lies live in these wounds. 
um, ungodly emotions or emotions that we're unable to control, unforgiveness, curses, demons, and soul ties. And today I'm gonna really focus on unforgiveness. This is a key. I'm gonna teach on this and preach on this today. Um, and I want us to have breakthrough and understanding how unforgiveness affects us, okay? So I wanted to really quickly kind of explain. I mentioned last week that we have a whole sermon on the similarities and difference of the heart and soul between the Greek and Hebrew words. I'm gonna use them interchangeably today. Um, you know, and as we do, because we talk about um, that we have our spirit, soul, and body. And when I'm talking about Jesus binding up our broken heart, I'm talking about the soul. And then when I'm gonna compare that to our heart and how our heart is made up of our mind, will, and emotions, okay? So um, there's a whole other sermon on that if you want more revelation on this. Today, that's not the point of my sermon. But I'm going to be talking about last week, we talked about Jesus came to bind up our broken heart, and our heart lives in the seat of our soul. And so that's the part that's still being renewed, right? We know we have to renew our mind, right? The triggers come from this portion of our heart, if we break up our heart this way, and our will follows. So a lot of times, when we have the truth in our mind, we know we know that we're supposed to, you know, do something from the Lord. He says, don't do this. And then for some reason, we can't do it. A lot of times it's because of a wound that's interplaying with that. Okay, does that make sense? So our will will follow when our emotions and our mind come into alignment. When our heart becomes healed, then our emotions and our, our, our will actually be able to follow what it is. So for example, um, you know, you can, you can know, Tom can know in his mind, he's not a burden of the Lord. But then when things happen that he's supposed to do, let's say God tells him to ask for help, his will doesn't follow because he has this part of his soul that feels like he's a burden. And so then he doesn't want to ask for help or feels bad when he asks for help. Does that make sense? So then when his heart is healed, now if, God, if he needs to ask for help, then his will follows in obedience and, and freely because his, his emotions and his mind are whole. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the analogy I wanted to kind of point out, and I'll reference back to that. Fear. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Yeah. So, for example, we know, like, the Lord says, go, right? We're, you know, supposed to go and preach people, help people do different things. He might tell you to whatever, make a seed offering. He might tell you to pray for someone. He might tell you to um, start a business, whatever it is, right? Um, the Lord tells us to do things. And then we have, like, wounds of fear, as someone was just saying. And so then when we go to actually obey the Lord, we're unable to do that until we receive healing in our hearts. Does that make sense? So this kind of all goes together, and so I really just kind of wanted to paint that analogy. Tom really saw that this week. We wanted to draw it up for you. You can understand that a lot of times when we're unable to fulfill what we know we're supposed to fulfill in obedience of any kind, there are a lot of times that's because we have these little, we are talking about um, basically like little broken parts in our hearts, you know, and they're fractured off, and they're holding these different things, and then we're trying to live in our renewed mind, but there's something holding us back. Does that make sense? And when we receive inner healing, this part gets healed, and then this gets removed, and this gets healed, and this gets healed, until we are completely so zoned, okay? Inner healing and deliverance is, and renewing our mind is not done in a day. We'd all like it to be just like a diet, right? Let's be real. We all want the diet to take one week, and it takes three months, okay? That's kind of how a lot of people feel about inner healing and deliverance. They're like, I got delivered once, you know? And I'm like, awesome. Um, again, like sometimes, I mean, God can do anything. But my point is, is that it really helps if you don't have a mindset of that. I had inner healing once. Okay, what we talk about is we don't, we're not going after trying to find if there's problems. I'm saying when a problem manifests itself, when sin manifests itself, now you have a tool to go find out where in your heart and where that came from. Does that make sense? So I get, we talked about glory to glory to glory. I, I don't walk around feeling broken all the time. That's not, that's not the Lord. But I understand when something comes up that is not of the Lord, that I get to go get more healing, and then I go back into, like, I feel so free. So I walk in freedom, but there can still be more. Does that make sense? So don't walk in brokenness. That's the devil. But you don't have to also believe the lie that everything's done, and everything's like, oh, I'm all good when things aren't good. Okay? There's more for you. 
There's more healing in your soul available, more deliverance available to you. Um, it's, not, it's not a one and, one and done thing, and that's okay. And you don't need to feel, any, feel bad about that. Don't let the enemy make you feel like that's wrong. This is a part of the process of being sanctified and made to look just like Christ. Well, the same thing I hear a lot with unforgiveness. People will say, um, I will say, have you, you know, because we'll explain to you, but unforgiveness is a key in the scripture. So a lot of times when we're praying with people, it's a key to, um, to healing, it's a key to deliverance, and it's a, it's a key for repentance. And so a lot of times we'll ask people, have, is there anyone you need to forgive? I don't know how many times, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, I have no one to forgive. Oh, I've forgiven everybody, I'm forgiving everybody. Okay, have you ever seen people say, oh, I forgive you? You ever heard someone talk about their ex-husband and they tell you they've forgiven him? But every time they talk about it, like bitterness comes up, right? And you're like, I don't think you really have, but God forbid you tell them that. <laughs> um, but watch me or your head gets bit off. But you know what I'm saying? A lot of times in our mind, we think we've forgiven because we've said we forgive out loud, Right? A lot of times, and a lot of us want to forgive. We actually know we ought to forgive. We try to forgive. So sometimes it's like we think we have and we have it. And other times we actually try and know we haven't. Does that make sense? I, I don't know how many times, like, I've talked to people all the time where they'll be like, okay, I forgave yesterday, but then my spouse did it again, and all of a sudden all that came back up. Or someone, you see, your boss or whatever it is, right, you're like, okay, I forgave. I forgave. But then literally the next day you're like, whoa, right? Okay, I mean, let's be real. How many of you guys in a fight with your spouse, one time, Tom, uh, bring up the past? Things that you've said you forgave them for. What's wrong there? I thought you forgave them. Okay? A lot of times what's happening, and I speak for myself in this, is I was actually wounded by what they did. So in my mind, I say, I forgive you, Tom. But the next time that wound gets poked... All of it comes out from the abundance of my heart. <laughs> it comes out. And it reveals my unforgiveness. Now, the unforgiveness lives in my broken heart. I got hurt. These are real things. But then if you say, oh, I've, I've forgiven him. Oh, yeah, I forgave him. Forgave him every time. I'm so righteous, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I forgave you. You know, the best is when you say, I've forgiven you for this, 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 and this, and this. <laughs> <laughs> and like literally as you're saying you forgive them, it's like all in like a list of offenses, which the Bible says to not keep a record of wrongs, right? So you're like literally like you're, we're like deceiving ourselves. Um, so here's a couple ways you know you're, you're not in forgiveness. Now meaning, I'm not saying that you, you didn't try. I'm trying to help you actually have your heart forgive, which I'm going to show you in the scriptures. But here's just a couple ways that you know that really true forgiveness in your heart hasn't happened yet. And I'm going to show you how to walk that out on a daily basis to where you never have to struggle with this again. But is when you do, you, you continually get frustrated over and over and over again about the same things, even though each day you've forgiven. A lot of times that means that there's a wound that needs to be healed before these can align and you will be able to actually walk in forgiveness. <clears throat> Another... Um, uh, another way you can tell is when you're talking about somebody, you know, even if someone like, I, for long, I don't have to see my dad very often, unfortunately, I would like to, but I don't see him very often. But so it's not, maybe something, not something that comes up like a spouse that gets to bump up against you every day and kind of trigger those things. But I can say all day long that I forgive my dad, but the way I talk about him will reveal if I really have forgiven him. So sometimes you just know by the way someone's talking about him. And even as just, or, or yourself, you can discern, wow, have you ever said something about someone? You're like, I didn't even know that was in there. Like all of a sudden someone came back to your mind from your past and you're like, well, I had nothing nice to say about that kid in junior high, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is. You, those are ways that you know there is something, a root of bitterness or resentment or something inside your heart and probably from, and most likely from a wound that when that wound gets healed, you'll actually be able to have compassion in your heart for them and love them and speak life and, and not feel that stuff rise up when you talk about them. Um, when triggers come up, you'll find that the past will come up like unforgiveness. So, um, so that's really important to recognize. You're like, but I forgave. I forgave. So that's why a lot of times when we ask people, like when we're trying to get them free from something, we'll say, have you forgiven? Is there any unforgiveness? And they'll be like, nope. And we're like, okay. Well, let's ask Holy Spirit if there's anyone you need to forgive. And then someone will come to their mind and they'll say, I've already forgiven them. And I'm like, well, the Holy Spirit just told you. So which one's right? You are the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always right, okay? Can we agree on that? The Holy Spirit is always right. God is always right. So a lot of times then what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, let's, let's find out where the wound is that's still harboring 
the unforgiveness. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> these little pockets of unforgiveness live in these broken wounds, and that unforgiveness is sin. Black? Oh, okay, yeah. So, so and unforgiveness, I'm going to show you the scriptures in a minute, is sin. So what are we supposed to do? Like a lot of times I'm going to compare this to like, like healing or something. It says, repent to your elders and you shall be healed. So a lot of times I'm going to show you that this unforgiveness can be a key to your breakthrough no matter what it is. If you need healing breakthrough, deliverance breakthrough, um, emotional healing, relationships, um, just what, being more, people want to be more connected to the Lord. This, if, if sin separates us from God, then unforgiveness will separate us from God. So we want to be closer to the Lord. We need to allow him to heal our hearts to remove this junk that's in our hearts that's occupying our space. Does that make sense? So any area you need breakthrough in, this message is for you because it could be your key to your freedom. Okay, so I want to show you in the scriptures because unforgiveness, I'm preaching from experience. This was uh, my Goliath for a long time. All right, so I am not uh, preaching from as if um, I didn't deal with this. This was, this was my number one sin um, that I took a lot of healing to really get free from. Now, <clears throat> it's a funny story. I'd you know, been saved at 13, and so again, I really like my dad had abandoned me, and I actually got saved um, through the trauma of all that, which was amazing. And, um, and so I had, you know, worked up my whole life, like, forgiving my dad. But I had really spent my whole life forgiving him here, okay, because I didn't know about inner healing. So if you'd asked me if I had forgiven my dad, I was like, absolutely. Um, you know, when I saw my dad, I still would, you know, <laughs> but, um, but I really thought I believed him. I had forgiven him. And so um, that went from there until then also when we were in ministry um, at our last church within like a month, I got deeply, I didn't know what I know at the time, but I got deeply wounded and fell into a really bad trap of unforgiveness where I spent about almost five years, and I'll show you in scriptures, being completely tormented. And my life was miserable because of my unforgiveness. And until I got healed, then I was able to get free. And I learned a lot of really amazing things. So I'm gonna show you, but in that, part of my breakthrough came was I was uh, at a women's conference that Angie made me go to because Tom asked her to make me go. I'm pretty sure it was the secret plan. Because <laughs> one, I didn't go to, I don't, I'm not a big fan of women's conferences at the time, but also, um, not those women's conferences, but uh, at the time I also, it was connected to the, the church that we worked at that I had all my unforgiveness to. So I tried to avoid like the plague going to any events that were outside of our location. I mean, I would call out to the Lord if I could just please allow me to go to another church than my husband, literally. Like I was not a good place. So talk about me repenting on Tuesday for some of my rebellion <laughs> um, towards my husband came from that season. But anyways, I went to, I knew somewhat that unforgiveness was bad. But so I really want to wash you in the word first. Because if you don't have the revelation yourself in your mind that unforgiveness is as bad as I'm telling you it is, you're not going to be angry at it and fight for freedom in your soul. Does that make sense? So I really want to show you these scriptures because I was in a class at this women's conference. The Lord set me up. It was totally the Lord. I had to either go listen to a sermon by the person I hated the most or go to a class on unforg unforgiveness. I'm telling you, I'm holding this sheet of paper that tells you the conference topics, and I'm like, oh. I was like, oh my gosh. So I went to this forgiveness class to try to prove that my, for my unforgiveness was justified. I'm sitting there. I mean, how proud was I? <laughs> I'm like, no, but they just don't know. They don't even know what these people have done to me. They don't even know. And, you know, of course, I'm a prophetic person, and that's the worst. So when you're a prophetic person and you have unforgiveness and fear and bitterness, all of the stuff that you see is now tainted by that. And that would drive me nuts because I would say truthful things and no one would receive it because it was nasty. I'm talking nasty Bitter, unforgiving, prophetic people, it's the worst. You have to uproot it. You have to because rebellion is the spirit of witchcraft. So as I was in rebellion, all the things I see and saw were all nasty. So very important, okay? Very, very important.
I want to start in, um, and you think it's the Lord. All your suspicion, all your fear, everything. You think God's as angry as you are. Now, God may be angry, but not like I was. Okay? So it's very deceptive. And so it's the most dangerous thing to a charismatic church is this. Because you do not want to be prophesying from anything other than love of the Lord. Okay? So I want us to turn to Matthew 6, verse 12. And I'm just going to lay out a couple verses. There's so many more but a few verses that tell us about unforgiveness so you can renew your mind before we go into healing. I'm so thirsty. I'm sorry. Yeah, I seriously, Tom's laughing because it was so true. Oh, put your hand on your heart. Uh, I mean, he's had to get inner healing from that season, um, from me. Um, yeah, it was not fun. Um, for anyone involved in the situation, um, there's a good testimony at the end of it, though, so I'll tell you more later. But uh, Matthew 6, 12, and this is in the Lord's Prayer. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Okay, so one, it's supposed to be a daily prayer that we forgive others. Now, that's all cute. Let's turn to verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, that whole like saying like unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping it kills the other person. Okay. Well, one, I'm going to show you in the next scripture that it kills both of you. Very important. That's actually not true. It kills both of you. But your unforgiveness literally keeps you from, from God forgiving you of your sins. That is the worst thing that we could have in our life is to not have God wash us in his blood because of unforgiveness in our life. So this is, this is like very important. Now I want us to turn to Matthew 18. <clears throat> 21 through 35. And a lot of people know this, but in this passage, I'm going to talk on it in several parts, and I'm going to point out some things that the Lord revealed to me just this last November when we were in St. Martin um, on, the, on the wonderful vacation we got to take together, and we spent so much time just in the Word. It was so amazing, and I was just, the Lord was really speaking to me about this, so I'm really excited to share this, but the first part was this first part in verse 22, I should say, but it was what they were preaching at this class I was talking about. So I'm literally like, they're preaching all these verses, and I'm like, well, you know, but, I mean, you can hear me. I'm literally like the disciples. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I, shall, um, uh, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? I'm literally sitting there in the class going, yeah, but they just keep, they just keep doing it. I mean, how many times do I have to forgive them (laughs) before I call down fire from heaven is how I felt, right? Before the Lord (laughs) would, would smite them, um, and uh, then literally then she, the next verse she quotes is this verse. And I'm like, oh. Uh, he said, Jesus said to them, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven. And so he goes on into a parable. So they quote that. And then I'm in this class. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, literally. And I'm like trying to, the latest lady pinned me in a hole in a corner with the word of God to where I had they had to have a confrontation with the Lord, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. And it, it broke, I broke and got freedom. So then he goes on to this parable that's really important. So he says, you know, you're supposed to forgive all of this. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun, so remember, we're, in this parable, we're talking about you. You're the servant. <clears throat> and when he had begun to settle accounts, One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And I can't remember the exact number. Tom preached on this a while back, but that's like, let's just say it's a billion dollars. It's like the most unfathomable amount, right? A billion dollars. Brought to him who owed him a billion dollars. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that the payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him. This is us, before the Lord. We have an impayable debt. Our sin is so big that we cannot pay it off. So we 
repent and ask the Lord to forgive us. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. That's a key word I'm going to pull on. Moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Hallelujah. This is what Jesus does for us. He has compassion on us and he forgives us of all of our debts. Verse 28. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So I don't know the exact amounts on this. I didn't spend my time researching it. But let's just say it's a thousand dollars compared to my billion dollars. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. I want justice. That's what sometimes our hearts call out for, justice, Lord. I want justice. I want you to make this right. Make them pay. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So where did the person that he didn't forgive go? Prison. Verse 31. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart, catch that, from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. From our hearts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. It's a lot. So from our hearts, we have to forgive. So this goes back to God comes to bind up our broken hearts. So when we're healed, we're able to forgive from our hearts. Okay? But look, at the end of this story, what really hit me on this last trip was I've all, I kind of had already had, so I want to remind you, it said that he was delivered him to the torturers, the tormentors, another translation says. What happens is, is we get put in prison... And demons are able to come into our life. Because demons have access to what? Sin. Unforgiveness is sin. Unforgiveness keeps us from being forgiven. So when we are in unforgiveness, the devil has access to our life. To come and torment us with whatever he wills. Whatever his his, his attack on his life. But what also really hit me this last time was that at the end of the story, the guy is still being tormented. And the person he didn't forgive is still left in prison. The other person is still in prison because of the unforgiveness. And this really hit me, and I started following the scriptures. And I really want to show you how powerful us forgiving is for the other person. So again, mind you, let's go back to like in a marriage example. If we continue to hold our spouses in contempt and and unforgiveness and judgments and speak death over them, we're literally holding and binding them to those words and putting them in prison to their sin. I'm going to show you. So, Matthew 18, 18. Which a lot of you, let's just turn the page back one. A lot of you know this verse. But a lot of us don't understand the power we have in this verse. And it's not just positive. In Matthew 18, 18, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Do you know we have the power to bind devils? We also have the power to bind our brothers. We are the children of God. We have authority in our voices. We have authority when we speak. And when we have unforgiveness, we actually bind them. We can bind in a negative way. We can bind to tear down strongholds, and we can create them. 
our unforgiveness binds people and creates a stronghold in them. I want you to go to John 20, 21 through 23. The other guy owed $2. Yes. Compared to 2 million pounds of gold. Okay. Now, and a lot of that is we forget. I think you see I'm running out. <laughs> I'm going to show you. Now, when I was stuck in that situation, I, wasn't, I had forgotten how much of a sinner I was. I wasn't mourning my sin like the Beatitudes tell me to. All I could see was that their $2 felt like $2 million. And in reality, my sin was $2 million and theirs was 2 In John 20, 21 through 23, this is Jesus after he'd come out of the grave. And one of his last things is he's commissioning his apostles So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We like that part. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And here's this weird verse that a lot of us don't quite understand. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. When we hold people in unforgiveness, their sins are not forgiven. When we forgive them, they're forgiven. When we hold unforgiveness, it's a sin. We're not forgiven. We have the power to release people from sin by forgiving them the way Christ did. A lot of us are holding a lot of judgments and offense towards people in our life. And that's why I mean by if you focus on you, and you get freedom, and you get healed from the things they've done to you, you will see breakthrough in them because your unforgiveness is actually binding them. Your judgments against them, the things you think about them in your heart, even if you never say them, are binding them in the spiritual realm. That unforgiveness and that judgment binds them to that instead of loosing them, which you have the power to do. And I think about this even my own children. The things I, I think or say, Am I binding them or loosing them? Am I binding my husband or loosing my husband? What am I doing on the earth? Am I bringing heaven or am I bringing condemnation? Unforgiveness is so detrimental. We want to bring the kingdom of God. We can't bring that with unforgiveness in our hearts. We have to allow the Lord to heal us so we can release people and be released all at the same time. Is that good? That is the revelation in the mind we need to have about unforgiveness, to know the power of it, how awful and wicked and deceptive it is. And the reality is in unforgiveness, we also have pride. What does God resist? Proud. Because like I said, when we think that they're, what they've done to us is worse than what we've done to Christ, you're already proud. You're already in pride. And that was what I had completely missed for so long was because when I got saved, I I did repent for some things, but I got saved in my brokenness, which is a really good place to get saved. But I needed God to come and help me. And so I kind of had this whole relationship with the Lord that didn't really... I didn't actually really repent or see my sin fully, like I had had layers of it until a year ago. To where then I felt like, I mean, I got resaved because I was in an inner healing moment. I've told the story, but about my dad. And all of a sudden, the Lord showed me my dad's brokenness and showed me that I had actually sinned against him and that I had rebelled. I was angry and I'd done all these things to him in his brokenness. And in that moment, I was filled with compassion. That's where forgiveness comes. I literally wept for my father, and I wept for my sin. Now, mind you, that wound at 13 years old was right before I got saved. 
That wound, when I got saved, led me to Christ. But it protected me, and the devil was protecting me, but I, meaning like from me, like in a bad way, it kept me like a guard to actually see my sin. And so I went my whole Christianity out of this not fully understanding my sin, not fully understanding how broken I was, not fully understanding how much sin I had done, how big it was, and how much I'd been forgiven until I'm in this moment with the Lord and he showed me and I literally was weeping and I'm like, oh my God, I could see my sin, like all of it from when I, all the way down to being a child. And I was like, I was like, he rewrote my whole history and I just mourned. Lord, forgive me for what I did. Forgive me for pushing my father away. Forgive me for not listening. Forgive me, Lord. I have sinned. I am a sinner. And I literally like got like resaved. <laughs> Like, in, a, in an amazing, I went home and I repented to my husband. And so what happened was, is all those wounds had built up all of these mindsets that basically made me only see everyone else as the problem. And God would help me deal with all of their problems. <laughs> that makes sense? God was saving me from my pain. He was saving me from my dad. He was saving me. But I never let him in to heal me and make me new to where then I actually got freedom instead of just him helping me through life. And I repented. And I want to share an example of this that I want to share sometimes how we miss this. And this is, Tom and I, Tom has shared his testimony. But a lot of you guys know that, so as I mentioned, there's so many stories I want to share, but I want to help you wrap your head around this. When Tom, the day that we got our major deliverance, right? We talk about the romance, I say major because we've had more since then. But we talk about that day that we got delivered, right? You've heard this testimony over and over and over again. Romeo came, we repented of our sins and we got delivered. I had so many problems. I was re-talking to someone this last week. Like I, and again, mind you, this was about five years after this original wound that then led to this deep unforgiveness. And I had anxiety before that, but my anxiety got worse, I, had, I, I, I got so sick. Like, I had so many tormenting spirits. I had so many different things. And I had, um, uh, like, bladder problems. I was having seizures. I was having, like, crazy different things happen. And we had prayed for healing, prayed for healing. We believed in that. We didn't understand the spiritual realm. We didn't understand devils. I didn't understand any of this. And this is why I want to really encourage you. If a lot of you guys have been praying for healing, praying for healing, but you're using the wrong key. There are other keys to healing than just asking someone laying on of hands and asking for healing. My key that day was that, one, it was a devil, and I needed to repent, and I needed to forgive some people, and I got healed, okay? So don't keep using the same key thinking God doesn't want to heal you. No, he wants to heal you. You just need to figure out what the right key is, okay? So God always heals. But mind you, when Tom, it's a really interesting story. So Tom and I both repent. We get delivered. And mind you, Tom repented for pornography. That was the first time I had ever heard that he had been looking at pornography the last few years in this event. So that first night, I'm so excited. I'm like, we just got free, oh my gosh, you know. The next morning I wake up, the devil's knocking on my door. He was looking at pornography. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da. And all of a sudden, I got like triggered like I've never been triggered in my entire life. I literally, like poor Romeo and Tom were doing the best they could with the knowledge they had. I was curled up on the side of my bed like, I'm talking like in like a, what you would call a mental breakdown. It's the best way. That's what you would, people, the world would call it. Would you say that's an accurate prediction of what that was, a description? I was in a mental breakdown state. I was fully triggered as a wound, meaning it was fully up as well with all the demons that were in them all came up at the same time. And I was fully triggered. Can we keep going while you do something? Okay. So what she she's talking about has happened to some of you and what happens is this is your current cognitive mind this part goes down this has a mind will and emotions this has this this, this is an event that caused trauma that your soul is harboring this part of her took the seat of her mind yeah and it's got pain uh -huh. it's it's freaking out because it's hurting so that part took the seat of her mind and she was in the fetal position. 
and we're like, uh, we don't know what to do with this. <laughs> Can't cast it out. It seems like it's her, they tried. but, they tried. They but were like, I don't know what this is. Now we do know what it is, but back then we didn't. So we, we were trying to counsel this. Yeah, Romeo's like, you just have to forgive. <laughs> just forgive. This part's like, okay, I get that. And this part's like, I hate you. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it was all there. It was, it was a really pretty. I mean, I'm not going to exaggerate it. I, I'm not exaggerating at all. But I had so much pain come to the surface. I literally felt like I wanted to die. Like, I was like, I cannot live like this. If this is what I'm going to feel like now, I would rather die. Like, that was how painful it was. Now, <clears throat> I shared last week, I had struggled with anger off and on, but, I, but not, not, you know, and it got worse and worse as I got deeper in sin and unforgiveness throughout those last few years. The anger outbursts would get worse and worse. But this wound had never been poked because Tom had never broken trust. But my dad, when you know my story, my dad cheated on my mom and left us for another woman. And I've shared this story over and over and over again. So Tom had never in all these years hit this. It got hit. And it came up. And I had had spent years in that pain going, I will never be with someone who's going to cheat on me. I will never, I'll never let anyone hurt me like that. So it was filled with a lot of mindsets inner vows, a lot of things that I was like, basically, that's why I was so broken because I'm like, that's it. We're, I'm going to have to leave them. So when, when you make a declaration, people, when you make a declaration like, I will never let that happen to me. This will not be, that's an yes. inner vow. Yes. Yes. And that has to be broken. Mm -hmm. So that's what she was making. Yes. She was binding I, herself I had to made inner vows. I my whole life against this moment that hit. So when it all came up, I mean, I literally, that was, I was so broken. My heart literally broke because I had already determined in my soul, my, my family's over. Again, this, I'm going to have to leave them because this is never going to happen to me. All, once a cheater, always a cheater. Like, I mean, it literally felt like, even though he never, never slept with another woman, it felt like he had slept with 100 women, which he did not, by the way. But make sure that's on quoted. But, but that's how it felt to me. He might as well have done what my dad did. But the deception was, is because I was fully triggered. And by the way, this happened when I was seven. So basically, I was acting like a seven-year-old on the ground. You ever seen a seven-year-old? Like, you know, that's how it looks. Now, mind you, I don't have the cognitive understanding to understand that this is actually from my father. I think it's all him. He did this to me. He caused me this pain. He's my problem. And then I was upset. Now, mind you, I came out of the trigger, and then I'd be fine for like a month. I'd be fine. Oh, I've totally forgiven him. I'm back in control of myself. Some sort of fear that would bring up distrust of any kind, silly stuff, would then come back up here. And I'd be like, oh, I've forgiven him. And I'd be like, you! <laughs> Look what you did to me! <laughs> and I was not in forgiveness. But then I would come back down. It would suppress. Go three months. Something would poke it. Rah! You! da 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 you hurt me. You destroyed my life. You destroyed our family. All these things. And Tom is trying so hard to love so me so well. So you can also have what Katie's saying. She had a protector. So these things can have protectors. It's like another part of it that wants to keep it safe. Yeah. So this is, a, let's say, a protector. Keep it down. Her, so this protector can be isolation, can be anger. Her protector was anger. <laughs> so it was she's fun a fun combo. This yeah. thing is harboring pain. It's harboring all this from the, her, the trauma that I poked through my actions, but that was created when she was seven, and the protector doesn't want anyone to get close to it, so it will get big. So I had this from a different wound. When That's why I would talk about my thing when I got, I was hurting people. Why? I was hurting. I hurt you before you hurt me, protector. So, ah, I'm like this little girl. Ah, and I'm like, oh, shoot. Well, you know, like, you know, so I wasn't so little anymore. I was like, ah. But it was trying to keep itself safe, and it was attacking first, yes. you know. So if you've ever had that or yes. you're going through that, that's what it is. Yes. And so um, I lost my train of thought for a second. But with that, so then Tom would then, you know, very graciously try to tell me. It's been like a, it was it had been a year at this point you know, after that, or a year and a half even, and it would still just come up every now and then, 
until I finally was like, I am, and I'd get more and more, I'm getting more and more like renewed in my mind, more and more freedom, healing in other areas. But again, I was deceived because I thought that the problem was Tom. So I kept trying to process with the Lord, go back to that moment, get inner healing from Tom, like, well, you know, things that he did, and I would try to forgive him, and blah, 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 because I knew about inner healing later on. But then I finally was like, I'm so sick and tired of having these outbursts. This is ridiculous. This is not me. So I met with Gail, and I told this story. But then now Tom had kept trying to graciously tell me, I know I hurt you, and I'm not trying to make this seem like it wasn't that bad, but I feel like it's got to be from your dad. And I'd be like, oh, no, buddy, it's you. And I get so mad at him. You are the problem. <laughs> no, no, you, this poor, this poor guy. And again, though, this is what happens. So finally, though, I was like, I don't care who it is. I need freedom. So I went and met with Gail, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit brought me back to when I was seven. And the same emotions I would feel were from the trauma with my dad cheating on my mom. And when I received healing, now in this, I told you about this, this inner healing moment, I was able also, because I was then still realized I was really mad at my dad, because clearly the anger came forward when anyone acted like him or did anything similar to that. So I was like, oh, I've forgiven my dad. Well, I would say not. And um, so in that inner healing, I, got, I was able to forgive him and get healing and was filled with compassion, because there was two of them in that moment. It was so powerful. Let anger go. And I was able to, all of a sudden, I could see my own sin. And so then, when I came back from this inner healing, I went home, and I started repenting to Tom for all the times I got angry at him and was mean to him. I never saw that. I thought all my anger and things I said were justified because of the sin. It's so deceptive. You know you're free when you're repenting. I kid you not. When you can see what you've done, you're healed. When you have compassion. And then I start to think, man, I'm so sorry you went through that through all those years that you were in that battle and I, I wasn't there for you. I didn't even know. I'm so sorry I treated you that way. I'm so sorry. Forgiveness becomes so easy because all of a sudden you realize I, I attacked you maybe 25 times with my words and said so, so many mean things, and I think that that's okay. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I got so much healing, and I was able to forgive my dad, and Tom was the bonus. It was so easy. It was like, this was just nothing. And a lot of us have that same thing in our relationships as we think it's all the person sitting right in front of us, and I promise you it's not. A lot of our greatest triggers are the greatest triggers because they started when we were children. And we've, so the devil's been deceiving us thinking that it's really our spouse is our enemy or our children or this or that or our sister or our brother or blah, 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 your parents are your enemy or whatever it is, you think that's your enemy, but the real evil enemy is always the devil, but it's the, these wounds that need to be healed. Does this make sense? So we, we have, if unforgiveness is that bad as I just described in the scriptures, we need to check our hearts with the Lord and allow him to bring up anything in our heart that is harboring unforgiveness and allow him to heal it. Wouldn't you say? That this would be a really important thing for us to do. This is, a, again, this is a lifestyle that we live. When, when things come up, because again, you just not, this never would have gotten triggered. So a lot of times we don't like it when, like, let's say you get healing today, and then, you know, and then you, let's say you go through an inner healing, you get tons of inner healing, and then in six months, new stresses and new pressures come, and something else comes up. We think, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? No, new trials pulled up new stuff. Does that make sense? So it's okay. So, you, like, again, that's why you're not like, oh, I'm just still broken. No, you feel great. You're, like, in glory. And then all of a sudden something comes, and you're like, what was that? Good news, you get more freedom. So it's, it's something that we do continually as things get poked, get triggered, we get more freedom. Don't push it back down and act like you're fine and, oh, I've forgiven them again. I've totally let it go. I talked to the Lord about it last night. If you didn't get healing, it's going to come back up again. Because again, the mind, it has to all be in line. Your will will follow. And the compassion, it says, your heart will be filled with compassion and you'll forgive in your heart. 
I've wept for my father in the pain he's gone through this last year. I literally, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to see him healed so bad in his heart. I, I just want to bless him and pray for him, and I want to see him, and I want him to know Jesus. My husband's the most amazing man in the whole world. God has filled me with love and compassion, like 1 Corinthians 13. Those types of things should be overflowing to where you assume the best. If you can't assume the best about somebody, you have unforgiveness. If you have a record of wrongs, you have unforgiveness. If things rise up with bitterness, you can't speak good of them, or these different things come up, that's unforgiveness in your heart, and the Lord wants to heal you. So we're going to start today, and we're going to do what we did last week if you were here. Um, okay, there was one other part of my teaching I got, I got to cover. There are different kinds of unforgiveness, really quickly. We talked a lot about forgiving others, okay? So one part of unforgiveness is forgiving others. Another part is forgiving yourself. And a third part is forgiving God. This is really important because... A lot of us, if we have things that we can't forget that are regret or things we wish we had done that we keep thinking about 10 years later, so sometimes our own traumas are ourself and we cannot forgive ourselves. We can't let go what we did. We can't move forward because we are binding ourselves by our own unforgiveness towards ourselves, And we can't see, we cannot, we can't believe that God would love us that much because we're still in unforgiveness towards ourselves. How about the guy that came either last night or Friday night. I think it was Friday night. Friday. Well, oh, God, forgive me. He couldn't, for, really the problem was he couldn't forgive himself. Mm -hmm. If those of you who were, yes. were here, he had sinned against God. Yes. He was asking God to forgive him, but really the team had to bring him back to, to forgive himself. Yes. And that was the big contention yes. of why he didn't feel free yet. So you can have unforgiveness towards yourself, towards others, and towards God. And all of them are sin. Now, mind you, a lot of people then think, God. So I wanted to share the end of my story back at that class. I'm sitting there with the Lord, pinned in a corner by the word of God, convinced that I have to repent for my unforgiveness. I know I have to forgive. And I'm talking to the Lord about it, arguing with him, of course. Like, but Lord, but Lord. Like, if I basically felt like if I forgave them, nothing would change. So we hold people because we think that our unforgiveness will force them to change. If I let it go, then they're never going to change. So I'm talking to the Lord about it, and I'm like, Lord, I just like, can't. And he says to me, you're not mad at them. You're mad at me. And I was like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. What do you mean I'm mad at you? I'm very mad at Tom because he wouldn't leave. I mean, I tried to convince him for five years, we have to leave this place. It's so dry. It's so like, you know, whatever. That's just they mean to me, you know, all my things. And uh, <laughs> we had, so I was so mad at this unmovable brick here that would not move. I was mad at all the leaders. I had enough anger to go around. And God was like, you're mad at me. And I was like, I'm not mad at you. He says, yeah, you are, because I won't let you leave. Two parts hit me in that moment. One, I knew that my husband was hearing from the Lord to not leave. And I was like, he's right. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> Number one. Number two, that it was the strong hand of the Lord that wasn't going to let me leave until I learned to submit. Then I learned to humble myself that I learned like so many different things. It's a whole sermon in itself. How to serve ungodly men. How to serve unperfect humans, knowing that they're appointed by God. So many different things. And I'm sitting there in the moment, and he says, you're mad at me. You won't, I won't let you leave. Because I've been calling out, calling out. Lord, please, anything, speak to my husband. <laughs> I had, like so many different things. And, I mean, literally. The Lord's like, you're mad at me. I was like, what? This is, you actually want us to be here still? And I realized if I had realized this about five years sooner, we probably would have been out of there way sooner because we would have had revival way sooner and would have got kicked out. So I'm like, Lord. <laughs> you see? Here I'm praying for everyone else to see the truth. And when I got free, 
change came. And I was like, Lord, this is you? Like, what? Now, now, he wasn't the one causing people to sin. He wasn't the one causing me my pain. He didn't hurt me. That part wasn't the Lord. But the Lord saying, you will not pass this line. You will not leave. You will not abandon post. You will not go until you get through and grow in the character I'm asking you to grow in. I will not let you go. And the thing about the tormentors, the tormentors are there. He allows, them to, he allows the devil to come and torment us to lead us to repentance. It's actually the love of God. If your child's on drugs, you're not giving them money. You're not going to help them continue in drugs. You're like, I'm so sorry that you're homeless right now, and I'm so sorry, but hey, if you want to repent, you can come home anytime. You can come back into my, under my hand and into my blessing. That's literally what the tormentors are there to say, like, that it's the love of God, that he allows it. It's not him, but he allows those attacks of the enemy to come so that we go, I don't want to live like this anymore, and we surrender. He's such a good father, and it's so amazing. And so, we, we, you know, and in that moment, I was like, Lord, I, I guess I am really mad at you then. And I was like, I, but then all of a sudden, I was like, well, you're good you love me. This means you're doing something. I've been missing it this whole time. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me. And something broke that day. And he said, I want you to learn to love these men. I want you to learn to love them. I want you to start praying for their families. I want you to serve them. Now, mind you, back to my other part of my story is I was called by the Lord at 13 years old to be, to be a preacher, to be a missionary, to be all these things. So here I am, you know, <clears throat> probably thinking a lot of things, and the Lord says to me, I want you to go serve in the nursery. Start there. And I was pretty much, I mean, I was in a process, but I just went and I served, which I wouldn't serve at the church, because I was like, I can't, I cannot serve here. <laughs> like, I mean, I was literally like in a not a good place. And the Lord said, I want you to go serve where no one can see you, and I want you to humble yourself and sit there, and I want you to love. And I did for like a year, all I did was just, I was the, became the kid's pastor. It was not my call. Everyone around me knew that, but it was my post. It was my assignment. And the Lord was like, I'm going to put you here until you learn to love. And so a lot of us, we need to really ask the Lord and look at our situation. And, and we need to forgive God in his essence, which is really easy when you realize, because if you know his nature, but a lot of the times we get mad at him for a situation. So let's just take one type of situation. Like um, um, you can have all three in one wound. So it's important when you're doing inner healing with Jesus, you ask him, who do I need to forgive? Because sometimes you might just think it's the other person, but sometimes it's yourself. It's a lot of times deception. Let's take someone who was, um, who was you know, a sexually abused or raped. Let's, say, let's, use, let's use a really easy one for the situation like date rape. So they went out, they went drinking and partying, and then their friend took advantage of them and they got raped. So they're really mad at their friend, but also they feel like the enemies come to lie to them that somehow it was also their fault because they put themselves in that situation. So they, they will not be free until they actually release themselves and the person and God for somehow allowing it to happen in his sovereignty. You can be mad at three different people all in one wound. And so we ask Jesus to tell us the truth, to tell us, and God will tell us the truth about the person, why they did what they did. He'll tell us, you know, not because it wasn't him. He'll say, no, I, I hated it too. I was crying too. This is, this is part of the broken world we live in. I'm so sorry this happened to you. You almost died that day and I protected you. He'll show you the truth about a situation to where you're able to forgive yourself. You didn't know. I promise you, you did not know this was going to happen. You didn't do anything wrong. He'll speak to you and release you so you can release yourself. So powerful. So we always need to make sure that we understand those three parts, forgiving others, ourselves, and God, because all of them are as equally sin. And so I want us, we're going to take a time, so if in case you weren't here last week, I'm going to walk you through this before we go through it, is we're going to have you in a moment, close your eyes, and you're going to ask Holy Spirit to take you back to a wound, to a memory that is still broken, that needs healing. It might be something you already know about because it comes up to your mind all the time. It's something you never can forget. 
Don't overthink it. Don't be like, well, I just, it wasn't the Lord that showed me this. I was already thinking about this. A lot of you have been having things come up already. So some of you just need to go back to the one that's already in your mind. You don't have to be over spiritual about it. He's already brought it up. Um, some of you may not have something in your mind and you need to ask him. But we're going to ask him to bring it up. And what you're going to do is you are going to allow it to trigger. You're going to go back into the memory and picture yourself there as that little kid or as an adult or however old you were and actually feel those emotions. I promise you, it's the good news is it's for the last time that you'll have to feel them again like that. But you actually have to go there and allow it to come up so it can be healed. It comes up already anyway, right? But you actually, Jesus wants to bring it up so he can heal it. So you actually have to go back to that and feel it and go, what am I feeling right now? I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling afraid. I'm feeling like no one loves me. And ask Jesus what lies you're believing from this event. Nobody wants me. Everyone leaves me. Um, I'm better off alone. Um, whatever the lies are that are keeping you from renewing your mind and knowing the truth and having a connection with the Lord and connection with others. Then you say, Jesus, come into this memory. So once you know what the emotions are, there can be many, sometimes just one, but sometimes there's many emotions, and then what the lies are. Then you invite Jesus to come, and you're just gonna say, Jesus, I invite you now to come, and I'll be praying over the room as well. But we'll say, Jesus, come into this memory and speak the truth. And I want you, once you see him, sometimes people see him, feel him. Sometimes he looks like a light. It doesn't really matter as long as you know that the peace of God comes, okay? So don't, so don't let the enemy say, oh, see, you're not seeing it like she said, you know, none of, none of that garbage, okay? So, but you'll just, you'll know that he's come into the room. A lot of you will see him come into the room, wherever that's at, into the room. And you're going to talk to him. You're going to say, Jesus, why, you know, whatever your questions are, you can even ask him, why did this happen? What's the truth? Why did this person do this to me? You can ask him the truth about the situation and he'll speak truth to you and you ask him until you feel like all of that is resolved, okay? And then you're going to give him those emotions. You're gonna hand it over to him, give him those lies. Now, a lot of times we, when we're in a private setting, which you can do this underneath, like just out loud, underneath your breath, you don't have to do it loud enough for people to hear, but you would renounce the lies and renounce the emotions. I renounce anger and I give it to Jesus. I break the curse of anger and I give it to Jesus. I renounce the lie that no one loves me. That's a lie. Jesus says I'm loved. Those are questions you can ask God. So if your lie is I'm not loved, then ask Jesus, am I loved? And he'll tell you how much he loves you. And he will heal that part of your heart. And so after then you give those things to Jesus by repenting for them. If it's sin, let's say anger and unforgiveness. Forgive me for my unforgiveness and my anger, Lord. I break that curse in my life now and I give it to you. You're going to give him those things. And then you and Jesus are going to leave that space that you're in. Leave the room and close the door behind you. He's going to heal that part. And then he's going to, you're, he's going to take that younger version of yourself and walk off. And you're going to see them disappear. And you will feel peace come over you. And those emotions you were feeling, you're not going to feel anymore. Okay? You guys ready? So I'm going to let you guys lead yourself through this. But first, we're just going to have you close your eyes. And you're going to go back to that memory and ask the Lord if you don't know one. Once you have identified the emotions and lies, invite Jesus to come. I just ask Jesus to come to every person in this room right now, to their memories. Come and speak truth now, Jesus. And it's okay to cry. Let it out. Do not be embarrassed. Just let it out.
Daddy, forgive that person. The younger version of yourself needs to say to Jesus that you forgive them. Give those things to Jesus. You can let it go. And then take Jesus by the hand. And he'll lead you out of that room, out of the room. He's going to close the door behind you. And he's going to take that part of you with him now. When you are, when you feel that peace, I want you guys to raise your hand so I know when people are done. And no rush, just take your time. Jesus, come to everyone right now that's still there and tell them how you see them. Heal their broken heart, Jesus. Take away all the pain. By show of hands, who who feels the release and feels like they're done? Right. Okay. It's just about everybody. If you're not, you can continue with that. <clears throat> so what we always do is inner healing and deliverance go together. Because every time we get healed, then we get to kick the devil out. Right? So I'm going to have Tom come up, and he's going to lead us in that. And if you're not done, just continue with Jesus until you feel that, and then jump into the deliverance part. And or your body gets healed, which could be from there too. So some of these things that came in, like anger, like rejection, like pain, those things are harbored in there. So we deal with the emotion, the trauma of it, but then there's a spirit that that was an open door to the enemy to come in, right? So that's the part. Well, this is gone now, and the enemy has lost its, its right. It's lost its room. It has no space. It has nothing it's holding on to. It was holding on to trauma, unforgiveness, and anger. Those sins that you committed, well, Jesus has dealt with that. So now it's like, uh oh Now the lie in some kind of circles of inner healing no judgment or whatever it's just a, it's it's just a in our opinion a false mindset on the, on this is that those things will just leave well we know that jesus confronted spirits and there was a confrontation leave get out right so this idea that they'll just leave well i haven't seen that to be true <laughs> so we must confront the enemy and say no longer your home get out amen 
So if you're you 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 had an encounter um, just now with Jesus and something was healed, I want you to stand up and you're going to join with me. And and basically, here's what we're going to say: every unclean thing. Go ahead and say that. That came in through this wound. I bind you. I rebuke you. And I command you. Get out. Get out of my life. Now, whatever the emotion was, speak to it by name. If it was anger, if it was pain, if it was rejection, if whatever it was, you tell it that that's usually the the so you just begin to to say, get out. So right now, Lord, I just pray freedom over your people. Every unclean thing that came in through this wound, through this trauma, we put a bind on you. We rebuke you and we command, let God's people go right now. Can we get the ministry team to come forward? If you're feeling like, yeah, you got, you felt that like release from the wound, but there's something else there. Should be the second year students that come up here. If there's first year students that want to sit next to them to watch or help catch if anything happens like that, please. Um, or if you're already receiving, you can stay in the place of receiving. But if you need prayer, come forward for prayer. Right now, we just command every unclean thing that has been working against God's people that came in through this wound that has now been healed. We bind you, we rebuke you, and we command you out in Jesus' name. Anxiety, fear, infirmity. We bind you, we command you out. Let God's people go. Out. Let God's people go. We command out. Let God's people go. We command anger, anxiety, fear, depression. We bind you and we command you, let God's people go. Let God's people go. Fear. We bind you. We command, let God's people go. Anger. We bind you. We command, let God's people go. Depression. We bind you. We command, let God's people go. Infirmity is usually a big one. There's almost always a spirit of infirmity that comes into wounds. This is where most people's sickness won't go through prayer of healing or comes back is because it's actually a wound, a spirit that came in through a wound, not sin that doesn't have a wound. That spirit will leave. Oftentimes healing will happen. But if it's connected to a wound, that infirmity, whether diabetes or heart disease or, or any of those type of things, it won't leave until the wound. Oftentimes, if it does leave, it'll come back because it still has a door. But once the door is gone, we can tell that infirmity to leave. So I, if anyone had that encounter, say, infirmity, you got healing, you got inner healing just in, with a moment with Jesus. Say, infirmity, get out. Let me go. If you have any specific infirmities, diabetes, heart, whatever, heart palpitation, off, whatever that is, um, tell to leave. Tell to leave. Tell to leave. So right now, we just release peace over God's people, a release over God's people, freedom over God's people. Right now, I release the fire of God upon every unclean spirit that's coming against God's people. That's trying to steal their freedom. That's trying to steal their health. That's trying to steal their joy. That's trying to steal their peace. That's trying to steal their calling. That's trying to destroy their marriage. That's trying to destroy their family. We bind you. We command the spirit of pride to get out of God's people. The spirit of anger out of God's people. The spirit of anxiety out of God's people. The spirit of fear out of God's people. The spirit of infirmity out of God's people. Let God's people go. Fire on every unclean spirit that's trying to come against God's people. Out of God's people now. If you need prayer, come forward. If you need prayer, come forward. I see George here. If there's a male that wants prayer, even if you're female, and, and, and we can get another student with George, that'd be great. Brandy's over here. You need prayer. David, are you alone? Are you able to pray? Would you join um, George? And if you're out there and you're, and you're, and you're good, you're all good, pray for these guys. Just say, Lord, come and deliver, come and heal, come and, and set them free. 
I see some of you are still receiving healing right now. Just invite Jesus to that place. Freedom and healing, Lord. Jesus, come to these hurting places and heal your people. Come to these hurting places and heal these people. Jesus, you're our deliverer. We call upon you. Deliver your people. Deliver your people, Lord. Now I want to pray for those who are out there still and that you're all good and everything's great. I want to bless you and release you. If you still need prayer, you can wait. But Father, I bless your people. I ask that you bless them. You keep them. Protect them, Lord. Make your face to shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lead them by your spirit. Fill them with your peace. I bless them and their families and their children and their marriages and their businesses and their work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Two services, one at 9, one at 11.30. Back to normal next week. God bless you guys. Enjoy the Super Bowl. If you were blessed by this video, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.